news, everyone. I'm Jay Elias, General Legal Counsel at Dyer Lake Funeral Home in North Attleboro, and welcome to this episode of Live and Learn, a series of programs designed to be informative, educational, and upbeat, always intended to enhance and encourage our personal wellness and awareness. Headline stress disorder, doom scrolling, bad news fatigue. Headline stress disorder might sound ridiculous, but research shows that reading or watching the news can actually come with some measurably unwanted emotional effects, including anxiety, nervousness, and depression. Not surprisingly, there is actually a long history in our country of psychological and medical harm resulting from having more news delivered faster than ever through new and even addicting technologies over the years. As far back as the 1800s, neurologists and psychologists suggested that too much news consumption could lead to, quote, nervous exhaustion and other maladies. Here's an interesting story. In 1923, the New York Times printed a front page story about a woman in Minnesota who was divorcing her husband on the grounds that he suffered from radio mania. She felt he paid more attention to his, quote, radio apparatus than to her, their family, or their home. And she blamed his new addiction to listening to the radio as the primary cause for alienating his affection from her. And reports of psychological problems again emerged in the 1950s as televisions popped up throughout the country and once more with the proliferation of the internet. And then there's something called doom scrolling that's been described as the compulsion to continuously and compulsively scroll through news feeds on a mobile device or flip through television channels in search of negative headlines and news. At first it may sound bizarre, but it's more common than you would think, sort of akin to when we can't avert our eyes from an accident or a disaster. It's been said that bad news is a little like chocolate or wine, something that in excess isn't really very good for us. But asking how much more bad news we can tolerate may not be the right question because it assumes that bad news is like a beast imposing itself on us when what we really need to do is reclaim our own personal control over it. It's been said that our consciousness is naturally and automatically drawn to stories about danger. It may be that we are somehow evolutionarily hardwired to detect risk in our environment, something that's actually been called negativity bias, meaning that our attention gravitates to negative news or events that are about suffering, death, and risk, so that we can in some way better prepare and protect ourselves. It's a survival mechanism of sorts. So if you find yourself overwhelmed with the barrage of bad news coming at you all the time, you may want to consider setting some news limits even something as simple as not listening to the news right before you go to bed. Read a book. Listen to a TV show, a radio show. Something to end the day on a positive note. And so with that in mind, let's take a look at some positive and upbeat news stories over the recent months and years. And let's just say this program is about some good things to hear for a change. So. Can you ever be too old to adopt or be adopted? Muriel Clayton was 92 years old when she adopted 76-year-old Mary Smith. A judge in a Dallas courtroom in 2015 made the relationship legal that had long been in the women's hearts. Muriel Clayton, then 92, had in fact raised Mary Smith since Mary's childhood. Adoption was something Muriel had wanted to do for a very long time. And Mary described Muriel as having been her unofficial mom for many years and felt the adoption simply made their relationship an official one. The two women are actually first cousins. And in case you were wondering, it's not like marriage. There's no law prohibiting adoption between first cousins. It seems Mary's father and Muriel's mother were brother and sister. In fact, they were together in downtown Dallas one day in 1950 when Mary's father suddenly died of a heart attack at age 45. Mary was only 11 at the time. 
Mary's mother had a long history of mental illness. And so as a temporary move, Mary went to live with Muriel, who was at the time a young married mom. After about a year, Mary's mother tried to care for her daughter. She was a sweet lady, a really great lady, Mary had said, but she just couldn't live in the real world. And so the stays with her mother just didn't last long. Other family members took Mary in for various periods of time, but Mary had been happiest with Muriel's family. And so when she was 14, she went to live with Muriel on a permanent basis, along with Muriel's four younger daughters. Muriel said it was on her mind to make Mary her daughter almost from the start, but she couldn't go through with an adoption while Mary's mother was still alive, describing the woman as a dear, dear person and saying she couldn't have done that to her. It would have broken her heart. And so Mary's mother lived in mental institutions most of her life, and when she died at age 73, even though Mary was grown and the hectic pace of life put off Muriel's thoughts of adoption, it was those passing years that finally prompted them to act. And so on Mother's Day weekend, 2015, Muriel asked Mary if she would become her daughter officially. And she did at ages 92 and 76. Muriel passed away in 2019, survived by Mary, her four children, many grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And we've all heard about twins separated at birth, and somehow, years later, and with the helping hand of fate, they found one another. So with that in mind, here's an interesting story. James Jim Lewis of Lima, Ohio, was adopted in 1940, just three weeks after he was born. Jim, as a child, had a dog named Toy. He enjoyed math and carpentry, but never spelling in school. And when he grew up, he married a woman whose name was Linda, whom he later divorced, and then married a woman named Betty. And they had a son named James Allen, A-L-A-N, James Allen Lewis. Jim worked as a security guard, drove a Chevrolet, and was an avid chain smoker. Then there's James Jim Springer of Piqua, Ohio. He, too, was adopted in 1940 at three weeks of age. You know where this is going. Jim Springer also had a childhood dog, and he also named it Toy. And as a schoolboy, he too enjoyed math and carpentry, but never spelling. And he too married a woman by the name of Linda, and they too divorced. And then that Jim also married a woman named Betty, and they too had a son they named James, James Allen with two L's. Jim Springer worked as a deputy sheriff, drove a Chevrolet, and was an avid chain smoker. And in 1979, Jim Lewis met Jim Springer, and the truth behind their startling similarities came out. They were twins, separated at birth, who had grown up not 40 miles from each other and ended up leading almost identical lives. It seems that although both their adoptive mothers knew their sons had a twin brother, Jim Springer's mother was under the impression that her son's twin had died. And Jim Lewis's mother may have known a bit more. But again, she overheard mentioning that there was another baby, also named James, but that was about it. It was a passing message that ultimately drove Jim Lewis to look for his twin. And so when he was 39 years old, Jim Lewis called the probate court, which had a record of the adoption. He contacted the Springer family, and within days, the two Jims met in person. They soon discovered that each suffered also from tension headaches, prone to nail biting, smoked the same brand of cigarettes, and actually vacationed on the same Florida beach just at different times of the year. Remarkable. While we're on the subject of good news and families, consider this even more remarkable story. Although aerial performer Jennifer Bricker was born without legs, that never let it stop her from doing almost anything she set her mind to. Jennifer was only a few months old when she was adopted by Sharon and Gerald Bricker, who lived in a small town in Illinois. In fact, when a doctor advised the Brickers that they should carry Jennifer around in a bucket of sorts, they flat out refused, and Jennifer learned to walk and run on her hands and bottom, fearlessly climbing trees, bouncing on the trampoline with her three older brothers. And although she was fitted with prosthetic legs when she was three years old, 
She never really took to them, choosing instead to move more freely without them. To their credit, the Brickers treated Jennifer no differently than they did anyone else in their family. And Jennifer has said that she didn't even grasp the concept that there was much different about her than the fact she didn't have legs. So while watching the 1996 Olympic Games that were held in Atlanta on the family TV, she was intrigued by the women's gymnastics team and especially loved to watch 14-year-old Dominique Moshianu. Dominique was only six years older than Jennifer, quite small, like her, and reminded Jennifer of herself. Jennifer knew she had Romanian heritage, but she also saw that Dominique looked like her. And Jennifer remembers thinking that no one else in her community in that small town in Illinois looked anything like her when she was growing up. And when Dominique and the U.S. women's gymnastics team won their gold medals in 1996, Jennifer decided right then and there she was going to be a gymnast. And by age 10, no legs, she competed in the Junior Olympics, not the Paralympics or Special Olympics. And by age 11, she was a tumbling champion for the state of Illinois. Again, Jennifer has no legs and wore no prosthetics. After the Olympics, Jennifer continued to follow the ups and downs of her gymnastics idol, who, by the way, in 1998, took her parents to court, alleging they had misspent more than a million dollars of her post-Olympic earnings. And during that court case, there was testimony about Dominique's father's harsh treatment of her. And it seems Dominique succeeded in legal, legally breaking free from her parents and taking control of her own finances and life. When Jennifer Bricker was 16, she asked her mother if there was anything they hadn't told her about her birth family. And to her shock and surprise, Jennifer's mother told her that her biological last name would have been Moshianu. It seems that although Jennifer's adoption was intended to have been closed, her birth parents' names inadvertently appeared on some of the adoption paperwork. And in fact, during those 1996 Olympics, when television cameras cut to Dominique's family in the crowd and flashed her parents' name on screen, the Brickers realized they were looking at Jennifer's parents. But because of her young age, they chose not to tell their daughter, deciding it would be better to wait until she was older. When they did tell Jennifer, she asked her uncle, a private investigator, to contact her biological parents, the Moshianos, who didn't deny putting her up for adoption, but they also chose never again to respond to her inquiries. Four years later, after much effort and soul searching, Jennifer wrote a letter to Dominique, her idol for all those years, and now apparently her sister, explaining the situation and telling her how she had inspired her to take up gymnastics, but choosing not to mention the fact that she had no legs for fear of overwhelming Dominique. Ultimately, Jennifer and Dominique met. DNA tests confirmed their relationship, and they've been close ever since. And in fact, Jennifer has written a New York Times best-selling book called Everything is Possible. And although this program is about good news, let's start this story with the not-so-good part. On September 9, 1914, Private Thomas Hughes of England was a 26-year-old soldier crossing the English Channel to join the fighting in France. A soldier since 1905 who was a member of the Durham Light Infantry in England and was among the first soldiers called to the war in 1914. Private Hughes and his brothers in arm landed in northwest France and made their way to the River Aisne, where German troops were entrenched. And sadly, Private Hughes and 40 of his comrades died there on September 21, 1914. And he is commemorated with 4,000 British unknown soldiers at a nearby memorial. But during that English Channel crossing, he wrote two notes, sealed them in a bottle, and sent that bottle with the two notes overboard. The first note was to his wife, and I quote, Dear wife, I am writing this note on this boat and dropping it into the sea just to see if it will reach you. And if it does, sign the envelope on the bottom right-hand corner where it says receipt. Put the date and hour of receipt and your name where it says signature and look after it well. Ta-ta, sweet, for the present, your hubby. The second letter was addressed to whomever might find the bottle 
and the messages contained inside. And that note read, Sir or Madam, youth or maid, would you kindly forward the enclosed letter and earn the blessing of a poor British soldier on his way to the front this 9th day of September, 1914. Signed, Private T. Hughes, 2nd Durham Light Infantry, 3rd Army Corps Expeditionary Force. Private Hughes left behind his wife Elizabeth and two-year-old daughter, Emily. Eight years later, in 1922, years after Private Hughes was killed, his wife Elizabeth remarried and moved to Auckland, New Zealand with Emily. Elizabeth passed away in 1979, some 55 years after Private Hughes died. And now the good news. That bottled note drifted for 85 years until a British fisherman caught it in his net. And when he opened the bottle and read the letters, he discovered that Thomas Hughes' daughter was living in New Zealand. So recognizing how unique the circumstances were, he flew to New Zealand to deliver the messages in a bottle to her in person. And although no note could replace the father she lost, Emily Crowhurst told the BBC that it helped fill the void in her life. And so what began as a sweet parting gesture to his wife ended up being a priceless gift to his daughter Emily. 85 years later. From boats to planes. In May 2022, what could have been a deadly nightmare for a pilot and two passengers turned into an unbelievably positive story when a man with absolutely no flight experience successfully landed a small plane at Palm Beach International Airport. Ken Allen, who had been a pilot since 1988 and a flight instructor since 2016, was behind the controls of a nine-seat Cessna plane, returning from the Bahamas to Florida. When about 60 miles offshore, he says his head started pounding and he saw blue lights sparkling in front of his eyes. And shortly thereafter, he became unconscious. As it turns out, he had suffered a life-threatening aortic dissection. Quote, that's when God said, I've got a plan, Alan has said and his plan was put into motion, and he kept his hands guiding everyone through the flight and successful landing, he noted. The plane went into a nosedive, made a sharp turn. Again, this may not seem like a good news story, but trust me, it is. Instead of panicking at almost 10,000 feet, one of the passengers, Darren Harrison, grabbed the controls, called into the Fort Pierce, Florida air traffic control and said, quote, I've got a serious situation here. Harrison told air traffic control, my pilot has gone incoherent. I have no idea how to fly the airplane, but I'm maintaining at 9,100 feet. After locating the plane, an experienced Palm Beach airport tra air traffic controller by the name of Robert Morgan, who also happened to be a flight instructor, directed the passenger how to bring the plane safely down. He said his first instructions were for the passenger to make a slow turn to the north, noting that the shoreline would be visible on the right. The passenger lined the plane up with the runway without too much help, and with the help of a fellow passenger, he was able to locate the speed indicator. We need to slow you down some, the air traffic controller told them, and the passenger turned pilot. Well, he was fairly certain that the brakes were on top of the rudder pedal, and thank goodness he was right. The unsuspecting pilot didn't even know how to stop the plane, so Morgan instructed him how to brake and adjust levers. And then, when the air traffic controller saw the altitude drop from 1,000 feet to 600 feet and then to 300 feet, he understandably grew increasingly nervous, and even more so when the plane disappeared off radar. But before he knew it, the plane was on the ground. The pilot underwent emergency surgery, and fully recovered. Good news. Speaking of airports, we've all heard the expression, when pigs fly. And although pigs will probably never fly, at least on their own, it seems they've been playing a role to play in keeping air traffic safe. Amsterdam's Schiphol Airport has been using 20 pigs as part of a test project aimed at reducing the number of bird strikes on aircraft. Collisions between aircraft and larger birds, such as geese, can pose serious danger, particularly if the animals are sucked into the engines. In 2020 alone, there were about 150 airstrikes by birds at that airport. 
And the pig test program, well, that was one of several measures the airport was trying to use to bring the numbers down. And it involved having the pigs foraging on a five-acre plot where sugar beets had recently been harvested in between the two primary runways. The idea was this. The pigs would eat the crop leftovers, which typically would have attracted geese and other birds. But by doing so, it made the area less attractive to those birds because they removed a source of food. They also acted like something of a scarecrow by scaring off the geese that would land in the field to rest. And while the pigs can't move fast enough to actually catch the geese, their attempts to do so meant that they scared them away. The airport had already employed several dozen bird controllers who worked round the clock, but this pig technique seems to have worked. In June 2021, a gentleman went to the Stumble Inn Bar and Grill in Londonderry, New Hampshire and ordered not such a healthy meal, a beer, a couple of chili cheese dogs, pickle chips, a tequila drink. And when he was done, he asked the bartender for the check. She gave it to him and walked away. And then the customer said to her, don't spend it all in one place. Because the restaurant was busy, the bartender didn't look at the check right away, waiting to get a break before submitting the payment. But because the diner had joked a couple of more times about not spending it all in one place, she went and looked at the amount. The bill was for $37.93, but the diner left a $16,000 tip. That's right, a $16,000 tip. When the shocked bartender asked the diner if he was kidding, he told her quite matter-of-factly that he wasn't and said he wanted her to have it. And in fact, that same patron came back a few times since then. And when the owner and the bartender told him they were all uncomfortable with that kind of money, he insisted he wanted it to happen. So, after waiting to confirm the $16,000 charge on the credit card was processed, the tip was split among the eight servers and bartenders and all of the kitchen workers at the establishment. That money was especially welcome after a difficult COVID-related year. More than 300 million people live in the United States, and each year, a little less than 7 million people donate blood. According to the Red Cross, annually, that adds up to about 13.5 million units of whole blood collected for donation in the country. Blood donations are used for patients in need of surgery, cancer treatment, transfusions, for blood loss from traumatic injuries. Arnie, an English Springer Spaniel, donated more than 20 bite pints of blood before his retirement in May of 2022. Arnie started donating blood, not to the Red Cross, but to the Pet Blood Bank in 2015, but had to stop making contributions after reaching the age limit for donors. It seems that canine lifesavers donating to pet blood banks are required to be fit and healthy between the ages of one and eight years old and weigh over 55 pounds. And interestingly, dog blood donors must refrain from international travel. Arnie started donating after his owner read an appeal for more canine blood donors to help save dogs. Each pint donated has the potential to save four dogs' lives, meaning Arnie has helped more than 80 other pups. And by the way, Arnie got a goodie bag for each of his donations and was treated to a basket of his favorite treats and toys when he retired. Here's an interesting story. It's sort of a bump with benefits. In November 2021, La Cadra Edwards of Tarzana, California, near Los Angeles, had just put $40 into a lottery ticket vending machine at a supermarket when, quote, some rude person, close quote, as she called them, bumped into her, causing her to accidentally push the wrong number on the last digit on the vending machine. Quote, he just bumped into me, didn't say a thing, and walked out the door, she said. Edwards usually purchases cheaper tickets, but the accidental button push meant she'd bought a $30 scratch ticket. And she said she was annoyed because she had just dropped most of her money on that single ticket. So once she was in her car, she started scratching the $30 ticket and realized she had, in fact, won the top prize of $10 million. She didn't believe it at first and said she almost caused a car accident while driving home as she repeatedly looked at the ticket. So she pulled over, looked at the ticket again, scanned it with her mobile lottery app. She obviously was a regular lottery player and just kept thinking it couldn't be right, but it was. 
And have you ever gotten a fortune cookie at a Chinese restaurant with that wise saying on one side and your lucky numbers on the other? A North Carolina veteran turned a restaurant meal into a mega millions jackpot after he used the numbers from his fortune cookie to win a $4 million prize. Gabriel Fierro and his wife eat at the Red Bowl Asian Bistro in Charlotte, North Carolina about once a week. And he decided on a whim to play his fortune cookie numbers in the North Carolina lottery and to his delight won that $4 million. And my favorite good news story that I'll leave you with is this. Adrian Zamaripa lived at home in Utah with his parents and older sister. And like many kids, he was fascinated by fast sports cars. And it was always his dream to own a Lamborghini. One day in May of 2020, when Adrian was at home with his sister as their parents were at work, he decided it was time to act on his dream. It seems his mother had refused to buy him that luxury vehicle when he asked repeatedly which cost, by the way, more than $200,000. And that sparked an argument of sorts between the two of them. So Adrian did what he felt he needed to do. He gathered up his life savings and took off in the family car, a Dodge Journey SUV, headed to California to buy the car of his dreams. Soon after his sister realized Adrian had taken the family car without permission, she called her parents, who were immediately frantic with worry. At about the same time, a Utah State Highway Patrolman spotted a Dodge Journey SUV and assumed it was an impaired driver behind the wheel since the vehicle was weaving across the lanes of traffic at about 30 miles per hour. And so he issued a traffic stop and the driver immediately pulled over and stopped. And when the patrolman walked over to the driver's side of the vehicle, he was shocked to discover a child behind the wheel. Adrian was five years old at the time and told the officer he was on his way to California to buy himself a Lamborghini because his mother had refused to do so and he had three dollars in his wallet. The family had no idea where Adrian learned to drive a real car, although they said that as a baby he could reverse his child size electric car with one hand. Not quite the same thing. And by the way, Adrian's parents will not face any charges according to the local district attorney in Utah. It seems that because his parents were at work and had no idea their son had taken the keys and, quote, it looked like he just snuck out from underneath his 16-year-old sister's eyes and made a break, the district attorney said. The DA also said, I have no idea how the kid got as far as he did, but he made it onto the ramp and actually made it onto the freeway, headed in the right direction, I might add, to California. So it seems that not all news has to be bad news. Sometimes we just need to seek out the positive stories that abound and are all around us. I'm Jay Elias. Thank you for watching this episode of Live and Learn. I hope you enjoyed it. I look forward to your joining me again for another program designed to enhance and encourage your personal wellness and awareness. And until then, remember, it's never too late to learn. And consider this, as the poet Walt Whitman once said, Keep your face always towards the sunshine and shadows will fall behind you.